apart a little bit. And then um, I do have some top sirloins for all of us to break down as well. So I always have to kind of show how to do this because my mother one day came home and there were my knives. She's like, well, let me sharpen them for you. Like, oh gosh. So she just takes it and just starts rubbing the knife on this thing. Like, put it down, put it down, put it down. You just destroy my knife. So you're always supposed to go on just about a 45 degree angle on either side. You don't have to do it fast, do it slow. You're supposed to do it away from yourself, but I learned how to do it towards myself. So You guys notice there's a, a beefy smell coming out of the cooler. So we have this thing called social media and uh, they want to do a post about aging beef in its own fat. So then they asked me if I could do it and uh, I said, okay, I, I don't understand the point of it though. So that's what's sitting in there. If you guys want to look at it, that's that beef, beefy smell. And so there's a, a crave kind of going around that like if you dry age a piece of meat but then you dip it in beef fat to age it and let it age and it's going to have this great flavor. I kind of say no, it's actually because you're just cooking it in all that beef fat that's adding more flavor to it. So they, they said, asked if we, we should do something like that. It was one of our, kind of our influencer that we work with. And so we said, okay, yeah, let's, let's try it. But I want to prove it wrong. So I make sure that we have one just dry age regularly for a control, one wet age regularly for a control, and then one dry age for about a week, then dipped in beef fat, one just dipped immediately in beef fat, and then one dipped in butter. So I've added more craziness to it, but, but it's got better flavor. I, I don't think that that's gonna be true, so we'll, we'll wait and see. Right now, I'm just pulling off these beef back ribs. Have any of you guys ever kept these for yourselves and uh, cooked them? Yes? No? Did you like them? Good? Yeah. Aren't they pretty phenomenal? It kind of amazes me how many people don't utilize these. We have had customers that will get in bone-in ribs like this, but they'll just discard these. They don't even think about utilizing them. But they're incredible. Um, I just was actually talking to a, a cut shop uh, this week on Monday in Toronto, Canada, and they're planning on making some of these cooked to sell, because they do a lot of just beef fabrication. They can buy these and then save them and smoke them and then sell them like that, so I think that'll be a pretty neat application. The cool part about these is you really don't need um, you don't need a lot of time on them. You can do them just for a little bit of time in the oven. And the only reason why I know that is because we had a customer in and they said that they really wanted to try them. And it's, we only have 30 minutes. She said, I don't care, just throw them in the oven. So I put a little bit of salt, pepper, and garlic powder on them and popped them in for 30 minutes at, at 400, pulled them off, and they were still super tender. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. I would always kind of peel this back skin here this is what we do even in, in pork. If you eat pork, peel off that back membrane because that's going to take away some of that sweetness. <coughs> I'm really just getting my dinner ready for tonight. I don't know if you guys <laughs> do, do like the strip steak seems to have some of that on there? Yep. So yep. So that membrane is, always sits between customers that have come in and they tell me that they don't peel it that they'll leave it on there, and then after they cook it, they'll peel it, and they kind of chew on it. <coughs> I guess to each his own. I don't, I don't know why, but it's very normal for them to do. So I tried it once, and I was not a fan, uh, but don't knock it to your tried sort of stuff. <coughs> so you can see those two differences there of peeling it versus not. We did look into at one point, because a lot of people will say that you can pick up more seasoning if you peel it off versus leaving it um, unpeeled. But I've tested that before and the seasoning penetrates pretty much the same way, but you do have seasoning <coughs> stick better when it's peeled. So if you, you want more of that that's crush, crunchy bite to it, I would peel it for sure. But I think it's just a better bite overall to peel it like that. Okay?
So then after I move those bones, I'm going to come back here and remove these feather bones. And this is where I was looking, those white chime buttons down the side. Okay, that's where I was looking on that. So I'm just going to come in and peel these back here to kind of make this a boneless rib roast. It's kind of neat um, seeing some more cutting expertise put into some of even our, our middle meat cuts like this and that you guys will see with your uh, sirloin as well because these are cuts that we really just thought before let's just make some big old steaks out of them and call it good but we can still continue to add more value to already valuable cuts so this here, pull that off and leave that here. And then we also have this big cap and wedge meat that's sitting up over here. So this is our true ribeye right here. This side is gonna be leading towards the chuck. Okay, so the head of the animal. This is your longissimus dorsi right here. Here's your spinalis and then this is your complexus. This becomes the true chuck eye as I move closer towards the head. This goes back and it's the bigger end of that ribeye right here. Okay, and that leads into the strip loin as well. And then your spinalis is your ribeye cap that follows all the way down this way. Okay, but this cap and wedge meat, I, you can see if I just kind of grab a hold of this and start peeling back. I don't want to take off too much of that tail yet. It separates really, really nice. Meat cutting is pretty simple. You just start kind of pulling on the seams and you're good to go. Usually that's why a lot of angry people are meat cutters because it's a way to let out their aggression. You should see me when I don't cut meat. It's a <laughs> bad day. Most of the days I'm pretty happy. But usually you're just cutting with the tip of your knife on one side and then you're pulling away with your other arm. One of my professors, Dr. McKeith, used to always say, if you're a true meat cutter, you're gonna have a really strong forearm of your dominant hand, and then a really strong triceps of your non-dominant hand. Just all, every time you're cutting a little bit with one arm, you're pulling back with the other. So here we have your boneless ribeye. Okay, and you guys are actually gonna have ribeye tonight for dinner. But we're gonna do it a little bit different than usual because I could take this right now and just start cutting it into steaks. But we've also seen and know that cattle are getting larger, okay, which means that our, our longest mistorsi muscle is getting larger. We're seeing more ribeyes that are falling closer to the 16 square inch than we are seeing the 10 square inch which we get it. I mean, even as a producer standpoint, you're trying to produce more pounds of beef because you get paid on pounds. It makes complete sense. But now think of it from a chef perspective. What are they gonna do with a big ribeye? If you're just to take it and throw it on the plate, it's gonna one, take up more than half the plate. Two, think about if I cut a ribeye that's 16, 17 square inches and try to cut it 10 ounces super thin, a big, thin, juicy steak. And that's not what people like, okay? Because it can either be rare or well done. There's nothing in between. So now how can we still capitalize on producers making a lot by making more, by producing more pounds, and then also providing a good meal for the chefs to plate up, have it look nice and fancy. Okay, so what we'll do is actually take this right here you can see this is that tail end there. And I'm just gonna come in back behind that ribeye muscle and roll it out of here. And you can actually purchase these already with no tail on them. They're just called a rib roll instead of your rib, boneless rib. But I can peel off all this here. And already it's looking a little bit nicer. But we can do more than this. 
All right, so now I'm going to take this and look again at that complexus and the spinalis, your ribeye cap. How many of you like ribeye? Okay. <laughs> what's the last thing that you usually eat? Or maybe it depends on the person. What's the first thing that you eat on the ribeye? Have you ever noticed? Yeah. They said the cap. See, right away. People that eat ribeye, they know that this is the best part. Okay, that ribeye cap, the spinalis, we always joke that this is the gateway drug to beef. Essentially, once people have had this, there is no going back. And so, we even have customers, one of them, Jeremiah Bacon, who's in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, he puts this on his menu. He has a four ounce portion as an appetizer for $40. $40 for four ounces. And the funny part is it used to be cheaper, but he was having trouble getting it. He was having trouble getting this ribeye cap, so he said, well, I'm just gonna price it out so then people will stop wanting it and then we'll move on to another cup. People kept paying for it. She said, well, if they're gonna buy it, then I guess we're just gonna keep going with this. And it's just an incredible, piece of meat. And I feel like people have known it for a long time, but I mean, even before I came here, I knew it was good, but I never ever thought of peeling it off of the actual ribeye and grilling it separate. You just always think, no, that's that's the good part about the ribeye. So, well, why don't we cut it off and make it something unique by itself rather than trying to keep it on that ribeye? And that's exactly what we're doing here. We get to remove it from there, and then we can even make it more <clears throat> premium by taking this, and I could peel off this silver skin here, which is something that you can't do while it's on the ribeye. Just get down underneath it and run your knife through like that. To see all that nice marbling. And you do this on either side too. There's silver skin on each side. And the beauty about this too is that now, when someone orders a ribeye, they don't have to worry about getting all that seam fat in between. That's usually the biggest reason a ribeye is going to be returned to the chef, is because they don't like the look of the fat. Part of me is like, when you ordered a ribeye, what do you expect? But now, basically opened up your customer base. So more people can appreciate this flavor. Now, I will have to say, the one thing about the spinalis that you always have to remember is that if I order a ribeye rare or medium rare, what degree of doneness do you think the outside of that steak's gonna be? Well. Medium to medium well? Yeah, so and it's great when it's at that. If you cooked this to a rare degree, it's gonna be chewy. It needs to be cooked a little bit further, more to a medium degree of doneness in order for it to perform at its best. And Chef Ashley is going to have that for you guys tonight. I made sure to lay out a few extra because I figured you would appreciate it once you saw it here today. Okay, so this is that complexus. If you guys are going to ever break this down by yourself, this is a way to utilize everything. One, this can always be used as a Scooby snack. Who knows what a Scooby snack is? <laughs> so... If you're grilling for everyone else, you put that on the grill, and then as that's going, you pop that off and you eat it yourself. So you are Scooby, okay? It's a little Scooby snack for you. But you can also take this, because you see how it kind of peters out at the end here? You roll this up here, and then if I were to take this and split it, tie it and cut some little complexus spinalis wrapped fillets. It's pretty good. Yeah, beef on beef right there. <laughs> <laughs> Takes beef sushi to a whole other level. Okay, so then you have this piece left and we'll take this and we'll trim off the fat here. And then also you have more silver skin on this side. 
You never really have to remove the silver skin because uh, we never really do on ribeyes. We don't at all. But I always just like to take it to the next level, make it slightly more premium. You might as well, you're getting your knife dirty anyways. Just do the rest of it too. But you can just take this, peel that back. You just, again, just run your knife right underneath the, little, the edge of it. And then when you get some on the edge, I just kind of, you always are like pushing away slightly to get underneath that silver skin. And this is a, a little trick that I learned from my mother. So uh, she's a tenderloin eater, and it pains me because we have these product orders every year, twice a year, through Certified Angus Beef, and she always wants just a couple of tenderloins, is her, the way she puts it. And then I ask, say, Mom, how many tenderloins do you really want? And she's, when she says tenderloins, she wants a steak, a filet. Oh, just 15. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> she does not realize that to cut 15 tenderloins to her liking, I have to go through about three to four tenderloins. And they're still pretty expensive. And I'm, I'm the nice daughter that moved away and feels guilty, so I pay for the tenderloins and say, here you go, mom, have these. And then I just sit there and watch the bill climb up. So I decided to try and make her life better slash my life better. And trick her slightly um, but of course I have to do this in a scientific manner because that's just what I like to do with life um, I feel bad for my child because I think her whole life is going to be a test but um, looking at this I said mom here I'll, I'll cut you I said I will cut you some fillets is the way I put it so I wasn't lying and I brought them to her and I did cut some tenderloin fillets, and then I also came with this ribeye, and I cut some ribeye fillets for her, like so. Does that look like a tenderloin right there? Okay, so I cut those for her too, and then what we're gonna cut here in a second, I cut some top sirloin fillets as well. Well, the tenderloins, when I gave them to her, I put one per package. The ribeyes, I put two per package, and the sirloins, I put three per package. So then I tell my mom, when she calls me, because she'll always do every time she cooks them, and says, oh yeah, I have an interstate Sunday, I can just get it and so I'll ask about it. I say, mom, how many were in each package? Oh, there's, there was two. So I have a little chart for it. And then, oh, they were so good, they were so tasty, but she goes on and on about them, like, okay, yep, see, that's a, that's a win right there, and then, you know, make that, and then, Tenderloin. Hey, mom, how are the steaks? They were good. How many were per package? One. How was it? I think I overcooked it. It was just a little dry. Hmm, funny. Kind of like dry. I wouldn't have guessed. Okay, so I just made a little note of this. And I have this chart with all these notes to show my mother. I have yet to show her because I'm afraid it might break her heart and she's going to say that she still wants the tenderloin. Is really what's going to happen, but I'm just going to keep it to myself and continue to give her these. Meanwhile, I'm also piling up on a few of those too, so it's kind of a win-win for us. Um, more for me than anyone, let's be honest. But now I get to this point where this, cutting another one of these, it would not be really, it wouldn't look as nice, it wouldn't really be a fillet anymore, it gets a little bit thicker. So I come here and I just look halfway on each side and I take this and do something that slightly seems terrible by splitting a ribeye straight in half like that. But now I can take this and cut these into more ribeye fillets. Also get some more little scooby snacks there. See, you can leave them like that. I'm just going to cut these really quick. Or what I like to do with these, because now I've got that edge on there and everything. It doesn't literally look bad when you cook it, but I like to look at me fresh before cooking it. So you just take those little ends and cut those off. And then these you stay for like a stir fry, Asian stir fry, you get a stockpile of those going. And then you have these nice 
round ribeyes, or you can always just get some bacon and wrap it in bacon as well. So there you got your ribeye filet on here, and then this one is <coughs> turned into some kebab meat. You see, we just add, just keep adding value to one piece. And so this was before, again, something that I could just cut steaks out of, and maybe I get 10 to 12 steaks out of here. Well, now I'm getting ribeye fillets. Now I'm getting spinalis. And you can even see how, how many ounces this is. Eight ounce filet. Eight ounce ribeye. Versus think of an eight ounce ribeye full steak. And this is how this is more premium. I think this looks much more incredible coming out on a plate like that versus having a big steak that's flat. And then you know you're going to get a better eating experience too because your degree of doneness is a lot easier to hit when you have it like this. Okay? And we do have cut sheets that kind of show you how to do all this uh, if you guys are interested in taking, taking that home. Um, this piece too, this is still utilized in industry. Uh, so we'll peel this, this part off right here. So this is actually a big, heavy ligament. It's made out of elastin. If you guys want to feel this, you can. This is what helps lift the big, heavy head up. Okay, so it extends forward into the chuck. It's a lot thicker up there, but it runs down that whole length. I have actually eaten this or and or tried to eat it is probably the more accurate way to say it. Um, we had a, a group of South Koreans in and they tried to convince me that this is what they ate. And I really thought first that they were trying to play a joke on me, like guys, you really you don't eat this. Like, no, really, we do, we do. So they took it and they scored it like this over and over, um, put the diagonals on it, everything like that. They threw it on the grill with salt and pepper and I chewed it and then I kept chewing it and I, and I kept chewing it. And then I spit it out because it got to be pretty gross by the end of it. Um, but they really do actually chew on it and eat it. And I found out the main reason why is because when you go and purchase beef from Korea in Korea, they'll leave it on there to make it sure you know that it actually is from Korea. So it's true to their country versus getting it from another country would not have this on there. But the generations that I were talking to was a younger generation, and they didn't realize that that's why it was on there. So I thought it was kind of neat that it was, they just thought that this was something that they liked to eat and it was normal to eat, but it was really more of a, no, it's homegrown type signal. So I thought that's kind of cool. Yeah. But then on here, we also have this cap and wedge meat, um, also known as special trim by some of our packer, packing partners. But this stuff is actually now getting utilized for a lot of our thin meats. So you guys saw that skirt meat, that outside skirt that we had in there at a few points this summer was more expensive than a tenderloin. That's how valuable it is coming, okay? It is an extremely desirable sought after piece of meat. Well now because of that, prices of other thin meats have gone up because they can't afford the outside skirt, so they go maybe to the inside skirt. Or a sirloin flap is another one that's pretty popular as well. Well now, because of that, we're seeing this piece get utilized a lot too for some of the uh, fajita meat or even uh, some carne asada as well. They, they would take this and usually get a little bit of a freeze on it and slice it super thin and then utilize this for your so it's kind of neat seeing the repercussions of just trying to figure out more things that we could do. And this, I mean, you can see still has some really good marbling in there, but you could also notice, you can see those muscle fibers really distinctly. And that's how you know it's a bit more uh, chewier, less tender, I should say. You can't really sell toughness. Um, so that is definitely going to need a marinade, but we have companies, value-added processors, that will take pieces of meat like this and then let it soak 
in a marinade, and you actually buy it in one of those, and it has a an en enzymatic marinade to it, which is so there's a pain, uh, which is made from papaya or bromelain, which comes from pineapple that they can let sit and let this soak in it, and then it's going to become extremely tender. And some of them you can sell them without any flavor to them; it's just the tenderizer itself. Other ones might have like an, an Asian type flavor profile or a Latin American flavor profile. And so they try to have them with specific cuisines, but it's really neat that they've taken that to the next level. So now you can bring in a piece of meat like this that usually would have went into 50-50 trim for ground beef, but we're adding value to it. And okay? this is again, just adding more value to pieces of meat that usually do not get utilized in that way. So <coughs>